Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll just get started in about a minute um, as people are settling in. So I see a few more people joining, so we'll give people uh, a minute uh, more. Hey, hello everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for this virtual event, Facts for the Future Equity, Community and Trust. My name is Sonia Shang. I am the project lead at the Alliance for Healthier Communities, or Alliance for short, and I will be our host and moderator for the next hour and a half. And um, this event is in both English and French. So if we can bring that slide back up. So language interpretation is available with thanks to our wonderful interpreters, Ruben and Francis. And on the screen, you will see instructions on how to do that. If that's a new function that you haven't used before, at the bottom of your screen, you will see interpretation, the button with a world on it. If you click that, you can choose your channel, either English or French, and you can just stay in that channel. You don't have to play around with it anymore. Um, and when the, depending on the channel that you speak, you will hear the interpreter's voice when they're speaking in uh, English or French based on the channel that you chose. We will also be keeping everyone muted, but please feel free to ask any questions via the Q&A um, or if you're having technical challenges or um, not finding the interpretation button, feel free to um, send a message to the host and panelist, and we can help you resolve that. This event is being recorded and the slide deck that is used today by all the presenters, as well as the recording in both English and French will be shared after the event. Next slide, please. Um, so we would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Thank you. The work of the Alliance and that of our members take place on traditional territories of the indigenous nations who have lived on this land since time immemorial. The land we call Ontario is covered by 46 treaties, agreements, and land purchases, as well as unceded territories. It continues to be home to many indigenous peoples who live alongside settlers, newcomers, and people whose ancestors were enslaved across the Americas and the Caribbean. We are grateful to live and work on this land. Recognizing this in a meaningful way means making commitments to sharing and help holding responsibilities to all who now live on these lands and the land itself. In our work, let us be mindful of these commitments. I would like now to invite Sarah Hobbs, the Chief Executive Officer at the Alliance for Healthier Communities, to give us a brief context. Great, thank you so much, Sonia. Um, not sure if we can bring back the slides. Um, hello, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today, especially given how busy I know everybody is dealing with uh, the latest wave of COVID. Wanted to give you a, a bit of context in case you're not familiar with the Alliance and our work. Uh, the Alliance is a member network of more than 100 team-based comprehensive primary healthcare organizations across Ontario. This includes community health centers, nurse practitioner led clinics, Aboriginal health access centers, community family health teams and family health teams. 
Alliance members work from a health equity framework and our model of health and well-being is focused on providing holistic health care that is community-led, anti-oppressive and culturally appropriate while aiming to address upstream determinants of health. Next slide, please. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to shine a light on deep-rooted social and health inequities, especially those faced by marginalized communities and populations. Racialized and lower income communities are among those hardest hit by COVID-19. Data underscores how challenging it can be for populations who experience systemic and historical bar barriers to access, necessary, um, to access the necessary information and services that they need, including COVID-19 vaccinations, testing and other supports. Throughout the pandemic, Alliance members and other community-centered health organizations have responded by providing access to a full continuum of supports, from testing and isolation supports to essential information about vaccines, to vaccination access through pop-ups and community clinics, to social supports for adults, children, seniors, and families. They've done it all. All of this while also continuing to provide the essential comprehensive primary health care for their communities that depend on them. Much of this has been done without any additional resources, funds, or personnel. So we were very pleased to receive funding from the Public Health Agency of Canada's Immunization Partnership Fund to resource this important work of providing tailored vaccination pro promotion and outreach activities as part of a cross Canada partnership with national and provincial associations of community health centers to build vaccine confidence and trust. Next slide, please. We have seen very significant impact so far. As of December, at the end of December, 85 online and in-person public events were held, which included webinars and community town halls. Over 16,000 individual and families were reached through these events, as well as phone calls, WhatsApp messages, door-to-door -door visits, and other individualized outreach. Over 220,000 people are reached indirectly through social media, local newspapers, and community or radio advertisements. And we can count 13,735 individuals agreed to book vaccine appointments or were vaccinated directly as a result of these activities. Without this work, these last mile individuals and families may never have received the information that they needed or access to vaccination in a trusted environment. This is incredible work. I will turn it back to Sonia now to introduce our panelists. Thank you so much, Sarah. I am delighted to introduce our fantastic panelists so that you can hear directly from them the ways that they have been working within their communities. So we'll be hearing from four different organizations, each with very unique contacts. And then we hope to, um, when then we hope to have a good chunk of time for questions and discussions. So throughout the panelists' presentations, please feel free to put your questions or comments in the Q&A. You can also vote up other attendees' questions that resonate with you, and we will work our way through them. And a reminder that our panelists will be speaking in both English and French, so please make sure that you have that interpretation function enabled if needed, and that's at the bottom of your screen with the um, world icon that says interpretation. So first we'll be hearing from Amna Iqbal, who coordinates vaccine clinic and outreach at Taibu Community Health Center in Toronto. Over to you, Amna. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen once these slides are down. Okay, so uh, thanks for the introduction. I am the vaccine clinic coordinator at Taibu. And today we're just gonna do a high level overview of uh, Taibu's history, our pandemic response, and then focusing more on our vaccine initiative over the past few months. So Taibu is a staple in the Melbourne community and has been for over 13 years. And it was created with our sponsorship organization, Black Health Alliance to address inequities experienced by the black and racialized communities um, and by a team of black professionals um, to address those problems. We have both clinical and community programming running at all times. So part of our clinical programming includes chiropractic, family care, uh, diabetes education programming, cancer screening, dental health, et cetera. Uh, and for our community programming, we have programming for youth, adults, seniors, um, uh, about exercise, education, uh, mental health, all of the above. 
So if you had come to Taboo before the pandemic, you would have seen a full house. There was always people in the building, music playing, exercise classes running. Of course, the pandemic uh, seriously affected all of that and has isolated a lot of our community members. And it resulted in a decrease in in-person clinical visits and a shift to virtual visits for both clinical and community programming. Um, this was obviously something that was difficult to accomplish as there's also a digital equity issue although we were able to seek resources and funding to assist our community with getting smartphones, laptops, and internet access. We know that there has been a disproportionate impact uh, of COVID on Black and racialized community. This is some data from the City of Toronto that shows that 73% of reported cases in the City of Toronto uh, for COVID were people that identified with a racialized group, and 66% of those who were hospitalized due to COVID were also identifying as part of a racialized group. So over the pandemic, <clears throat> we've had several different uh, responses um, in different sectors. One of the things that we did was in partnership with Scarborough Health Network, and it was an information campaign to help people get the facts about COVID, get tested for COVID, and get support um, for any issues that they experienced due to COVID. And that support was offered through our in-house COVID-19 outreach team that had both an Anglophone, Anglophone and Francophone um, component. And we've helped over 24,000 people with issues related to food access, family support, homelessness, mental health, um, information about COVID, information about COVID vaccine, et cetera. We've also done some COVID-19 awareness and community engagement with various different organizations across the GTA. This includes webinars, it includes digital content, and all of this has been translated into multiple languages. Uh, it was a natural progression for us to um, start a vaccine clinic at Taibu directly. Of course, it was a huge undertaking and was not possible without our collaborators, Scarborough Health Network, who provide our vaccine. They uh, provide pharmacists, nurses, and a lot of the infrastructure for the vaccine itself, as they have many clinics across Scarborough. And then our partnership with the Black Physicians Association of Ontario, who provide vaccinators at every shift uh, for our clinic. It's very important for us to have black vaccinators. And that's been something we've seen even from our patient feedback that uh, people who are coming to get the vaccine are really excited to see black vaccinators in our facility. Um, and then Taibu of course hosts the clinic. I'm the vaccine clinic coordinator and we have several staff on site to do the administration and clerical work around the vaccine clinic. Uh, in 2020, Taibu received uh, French languages services uh, accreditation. So we have been doing primary care for a Francophone population for many years, as well as community programming. And 93% of the Francophone clients that we serve in primary care come from um, black communities and 95% of them are newcomers to Canada which comes with a whole host of uh, navigation and accessibility issues. And so it was very important for us in the vaccine clinic to have Francophone representation uh, at all times. And so we have Francophone staff there for anybody coming through who needs, to, um, who needs translation, who needs support, et cetera. And actually a lot of the physicians from BPAO also speak French, which makes the process a lot easier as well. Uh, so Taibu serves the Malvern community, but it also serves anybody who identifies as Black, Indigenous, Francophone, or racialized in the GTA. So we have had several pop-ups across the city um, with organizations like Toronto Community Housing, mosques, churches, Catholic schools, um, corporations, and groups like Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario. And we've had several clinics, um, and all of these clinics have been run in collaboration uh, with these organizations. So their staff are also supporting and we make any accommodations necessary. So for example, some of the mosques that we worked with, they required privacy screens, they required a separate area for men and women to get vaccinated. So we provide all those accommodations as necessary. So data collection has been a really important uh, thing for for Taibu in general, but also specific to the vaccine clinic. Uh, we know that race-based data collection is not often prioritized. And so from, a, from day one of the vaccine clinic, we knew that this is something we wanted to focus on. And it's been a process that has evolved over time. We have had various different forms of data collection. Um, four of our sources you can see here, there's a self-reported demographic survey, a patient satisfaction survey, data from our outreach, as well as uh, currently a Ministry of Health sociodemographic survey that we're doing. Uh, so I've highlighted some, uh, some data from all of the, these different sources to kind of show what we've been collecting. So for the self-reported sociodemographic survey, it was data collected by our clinic staff at the front end of the clinic as people were waiting to get registered for the vaccine. And we asked questions about ethnicity, gender, um, postal code, things like that. It was data that was really um, kind of fluid and allowed, it, allowed us 
to see where people were coming from for the vaccine and we were able to make changes in our outreach as we were getting that data. Um, and we've had almost 10,000 people complete that survey. We also had a patient satisfaction survey that individuals completed during the observation phase of the uh, vaccine process. One of the questions we asked was, do you experience any chronic conditions? And if so, what are those chronic conditions? And we separated the responses between um, all respondents and Afro-Caribbean respondents. And we can see that between uh, all respondents and Afro-Caribbean respondents, there's a 66% increase of individuals who identify as Afro-Caribbean Black who say that they do suffer from chronic conditions. And when you probe as to what those chronic conditions are, we see that they report higher in hypertension, asthma, COPD, sickle cell, all stuff that we see and know from our primary care as well. We also ask them how they hear about the clinic so that we can uh, further kind of target our outreach mechanism. And very true to the community setting, uh, the number one way people heard about us was through family and friends. Um, and this is also seen later in the slides as we see our patient testimonials. Another thing we asked people after they had gotten the vaccine already was had they experienced any hesitancy towards the vaccine? And we can see also between the Afro-Caribbean population and the remaining population that there's a 53% increase of people who experienced hesitancy from those who identify as ACV. And when you probe further as to why they trust or mistrust the vaccine, the top three reasons for why people who identify as ACV trusted the vaccine was for the safety of themselves and others, for because their family and friends got vaccinated as well and to be able to travel. And reasons for mistrust include being worried about the short-term side effects of the vaccine, believing that the vaccine was made too quickly without enough research and the historic mistreatment of black people in the medical field. So uh, there's often a narrative when we see that there's a lower vaccination rate for the black population, that there are uh, there's an anti-vax mentality, but actually we can see through our work anecdotally and through the data that it's actually due to mistrust uh, in the system rather than because there is a anti-vax mentality in the communities. Uh, we started in April, 2020, and to date we are still running and we've administered over 31,000 doses. And uh, we have our uh, kind of online booking website where people can make their own appointments, but in-house we have our own email address and phone line uh, through which we have booked over 5,000 appointments for community members. And we can see through our testimonials, some of the highlights as to why people uh, preferred to come to Taibu for the vaccine or why they trusted Taibu. Um, some examples are they wanted to see specifically black physicians. Some uh, other people are saying the vaccine is administered at Taibu, a place that focuses on black health. So they trust the organization. Some people had, uh, you know, they were nervous when they came in but they were very reassured by how everything was running. And so we can see that they referred other people. That's what we see in the previous data that People came to our clinic because they heard about it from others. And then the one that really kind of underscores, I think a lot of people's experiences coming through our door is this quote in orange. I realized with more research how important it is for us to move forward, trusting in our modern day society. As a black woman, it's very hard for her to trust the medical system due to previous experiences, but coming to Taibu made her feel a lot better. So a lot of the work that we've been able to accomplish would not have been possible without our history within the community and the trust that we've been building over many years. Um, and that has really allowed us to uh, run this clinic with integrity and, and make it an open and safe space for people to come. Thank you so much, Amna. That was a whirlwind with a lot of information. And um, so I'm sure there are some uh, questions. So please do feel free to put in your questions in the Q&A and we will get to them um, when, uh, after all of our panelists have a chance to present. Thank so you. next, we will be hearing from Estelle Duchan, who is the Director of Primary Care, Mental Health, Health Promotion, and Child and Youth Development Services at Centre Francophone, also in Toronto. Over to you, Estelle. Bonjour tout le monde. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here and very happy to present today in French. I'd like to say thank you to the Alliance. So I'd like to speak to you for a francophone in the region of Toronto. The center, Fran francophone center is a multi-service center. A client is considered in one center for health. Uh, 
ce qui nous permet de desservir les... Il y a des problèmes de sang, en fait, pour cette intervenante. Pour ce qui est des populations que nous avons cherché à... Regarding populations, we looked at, in a general fashion, nos patients qui avaient besoin d'un accompagnement particulier pour cette raison, mm. euh, les communautés noires, et puis on a pu travailler en partenariat avec Tahiti euh, sur ce sujet-là, euh, les aînés, euh, notamment pour les aider dans la prise de rendez-vous, parce qu'on s'est rendu compte que pour les aînés francophones, avec un accès limité à la technologie, mm. ça pouvait devenir très compliqué de savoir comment prendre rendez-vous pour une vaccination. Donc, c'était quelque chose qui s'est devenu très compliqué et nous voulions vraiment travailler avec les jeunes et, au-delà de tout, avec les francophones, les écoles, les universités, pour leur permettre d'avoir accès à la vaccination. Donc, les initiatives que je veux parler avec vous sont notre vaccine line. And we did that at the beginning of our vaccination uh, in order to provide information. And that was done with existing personnel. And we, through an ambassador that we have, based on this, this it was like a call center. And we received and made calls. And basically, we focused on two regions, Toronto and personnel, because we had personnel who could help people navigate the system there. Since we opened, we received approximately 2,500 calls. And we also... We We had people that we need, the groups that I mentioned earlier on, And we had clients that were over 70, and they wanted information about the vaccine. And, and with respect to calls received, generally it was from people who wanted to make an appointment, but they didn't know how to proceed in that. So what I would say that it's very clear for me, so there, they in spite of the government was generally bilingual, it still was complicated for these people to know how to have access. And even more for people who didn't have uh, health cards, they were wondering, well, if I don't have a health card, how do I access this? And in terms of the eligibility that would change, or there was a shortening of the time between doses, so they called to find out, are they able to um, uh, get uh, the vaccine or not? So we assisted these people in getting their appointments. Another initiative that I want to talk about is what we did with our Ontario health team located in the Midwest of Toronto. That was mid-January last year. This team met to see how we could put into place this community vaccination clinic to really be a, a something in common between partners. And that allowed us to open up a clinic at the YMCA. It's important for us that this place is to be in a, in a, in, within the community, easily access. And so there's, there's a, a gym there, so people are familiar with it. And this particular clinic, we tried to make it as bilingual as possible. We did put up posters, we had uh, French language information, and we really worked with the personnel that were working at that clinic in order to make sure that we had people from different organizations in Ontario. And so these people were carrying out roles that are different than their usual roles. We wanted to make sure that we had bilingual people on site. Another other work that we did, we worked with student nurses from the university, nursing students rather, and they identified for us these students who were bilingual, which allowed us once again to put them in 
strategic positions at the clinic to help us out. And we hired um, an ambassador, uh, a francophone ambassador uh, at, on site. And that person was there to accompany uh, francophones who during the process and needed accompaniment during their process and in order to speak to the professionals, explain to them the process. We also had some days that were particularly open for francophones. So we had uh, francophone specific clinics in order to assure that all the positions were carried out by bilingual uh, people. And that was really appreciated by our francophone community. And it, people specifically went there. They felt more comfortable to come to a francophone clinic because there was some worries by these people to not understand in the, the, the consent process at these clinics. And I would like to share with you that I was present at the YMCA clinic and it often arrives that, uh, that they're not very sure of, uh, it happens that they're not sure of the information, they're not sure of what is being asked. So for me, it's really important to have had um, uh, francophone people there at that particular clinic. And thanks to the project that we did have, we ordered different activities, awareness to raise awareness, so we did activities uh, based on something that was already done. So here are some examples. We worked with the TTC in order to have um, family activities in the summer. We had activities in the park so that the families could come with their children to get information and they could uh, get help on getting an appointment. We also had an HIV week, and that was the uh, possibility of speaking about the differences between HIV and COVID. And people that are wondering for if someone is HIV positive, is it safe for them to receive the vaccine? And there were different uh, campaigns that were done um, on a digital basis for our vulnerable populations during Christmas time. Um, we always provided uh, the information based on activities linked to vaccination. And we knew that other uh, populations and priority groups could be reached. And of course, we held webinars uh, related to vaccination for people to ask their questions. And that, that was uh, with respect to whether vaccination for youth and children in order to provide information about uh, what was happening in the community. The interpreter would like to ask the speaker to speak louder. Oh, also, we worked on social media as well with the Francophone community because we touched the entire uh, region of Greater Toronto so we can have a, as large a scope as possible. So we did all this and we focused on different groups. I already mentioned the, the Midwest Toronto Ontario Health Team. It's in Toronto and we also have some other initiatives with the City of Toronto. Uh, we have different clusters, the newcomer cluster, the Black Resistance uh, resilience cluster, and that was also in alliance, uh, in coordination with Taibu, and also one for the Alliance of for Healthier Communities, as well as the FCG Refugee Center, in order to reach these specific groups, and within these groups, be a reference point for the Fran francophone population. 
in order to uh, have uh, health services in the French language. Thank you so much, and I look forward to hearing your questions later on. Thank you so much, Estelle. Um, I know that we had a, a little bit of a technical blip with interpretation, so apologies for people who were on the interpretation line. And if you have any questions on something you might have missed or want to ask a question, please feel to, free to use the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, so we'll come back to that. And uh, so a reminder for our presenters to um, need, probably need to speak louder to help our interpreters. The next step, I would like to introduce Gibray, um, the Manager of Community Programs and Services and NLL's Community Health Worker at Woolwich Community Health Center. And we are now moving out of Toronto into a rural setting. Over to you, um, Gibray. And Anna, if we can just bring that one slide up. Thank you. Thank you for inviting Thank you for inviting us to Merci share de votre invitation à nous de partager our experience. nos expériences. I hear a voice, I don't know. J'entends voix. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, uh, inviting us to share uh, our experience with the vaccine for those who don't know where we are, uh, with which community health center is located in Waterloo region. Waterloo region has three cities, Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, and four townships. The health center uh, service to township, Woolwich uh, and Wellesley township. Uh, the health center uh, uh, serves the general uh, community in the two townships with uh, five priority populations, seniors, uh, rural, uh, community members, families, children and youth, and the Mennonite uh, communities. Uh, our focus for the vaccine has been on the Mennonite uh, communities. Uh, it is a long uh, history uh, and rich about the Mennonite communities. Uh, I'm not the right person to talk about the Mennonite communities, but I will give a, a brief outline. Uh, it is estimated uh, uh, about 8,000 to 10,000 uh, Mennonite uh, community members reside in the two townships uh, in, and in general in Waterloo region. Mennonites are members of the Anabaptist Christian religion group um, and their movement out of the uh, Protestant Reformation in Europe. Mennonites are diverse uh, with diverse denomination. Uh, for example, no German speaking, old order Mennonites, David Martins, uh, Amish, and there are other groups also. Um, but they are united by their belief in adult baptism and living a simple life independent from mainstream society. We find people uh, without modern technology, without phone, without TV, without heaters, uh, without luxury uh, home items. Um, uh, and the uh, horse buggy uh, that you see on the picture also as uh, the main transportation. Uh, throughout their history, the Mennonites have uh, faced obstacles leading to various periods of uh, mass migration. The migration from Europe to North America, to South America, Latin America, and back to North America uh, in pursuit of uh, freedom. Uh, free from discrimination, free from per persecution based on their uh, uh, religion and culture. Um, many of the Mennonites, uh, reside in Southwest uh, Ontario, uh, the largest in uh, Waterloo region, uh, uh, face those kind of obstacles. As a result, we don't see uh, data that exists to tell us about the health outcomes uh, of the Mennonite communities, how they access uh, health and the social services, and the social determinants that affect them. Uh, due to the lack of mistrust, uh, 
disengagement uh, and independent uh, life from the mainstream, including institutions, organizations surrounding them. Uh, that is why in this uh, pandemic time, we, we, we want to focus on the Mennonite communi communities. There is lack of understanding of the culture and how to work with the Mennonite communities from main, uh, from main uh, uh, stream uh, organizations and institutions, including the healthcare system. This has been the context we started the vaccine outreach project with the help of the Alliance. Um, the purpose of the project is to ensure that the Mennonite communities have access to vaccine information and education they need and want in the way that is culturally sensitive and relevant, and also that is appropriate. Um, for this, uh, we hired two uh, outreach vaccine outreach workers uh, to help us uh, engage the community. Uh, my colleague Anawal will talk about uh, what we did, uh, what worked uh, and what didn't work uh, during this journey started last April uh, to, to date. Hello everyone. Um, so yes, I was one of the outreach workers uh, working with the team, uh, we created uh, three videos in the low German language that have been shared widely in the community. Uh, we do some uh, media campaigns, local newspapers, newsletters uh, to reach the broader Mennonite and rural communities, uh, social media, mainly WhatsApp, YouTube, radio ad, and one-on-one -on -one outreach to provide information that allows them to make informed decisions. My consistent message in the work that I've been doing has been, uh, it is important to make this decision for yourself based on the advice of your medical care professionals and offering them assistance throughout that process, providing interpretation, cultural support, such as accompanying families to appointments, including interpretation at appointments and other supports and booking appointments, providing step-by-step -step instructions such as parking, where the door is to walk in, what to say uh, when people greet you and, that, and those kinds of instructions. As well as the communication strategy for future community engagement in the Mennonite and rural community. One success story uh, and testimony on personal experience on getting vaccinated in spite of family members um, anti-vaxxers and uh, conspiracy theories and loved ones advising against it. Um, so I too come from this, uh, from the Lodrum background uh, community and I also walk this same story with some of the community members uh, experience it similarly. So they're more interested to learn on how I deal with those outside influences um, when I first began to promote vaccines uh, over WhatsApp, uh, people were upset, uh, claiming that I was on the wrong side of, uh, of the, the pandemic, that I should help and promote anti-vax rather than pro-vax. Um, then people started to realize um, that actually I was the one to go to if they were to change their mind and they were not alone on the other side of that. Um, so then many people uh, sent me messages asking me to stop, especially when we started promoting for children. Uh, they said, you know, adults can make their own decisions, but leave the children alone. Don't uh, promote this to parents. It's not safe. Uh, they, all the conspiracies they'd heard, they were concerned. They had legitimate reasons to be concerned. But then as time went on and stories told to be true that COVID is serious and families in Mexico traveling back and forth ended up stuck somewhere with COVID very sick. And then it became more real in their own community and uh, members came forward and apologized to me for being mean to me and telling me all the stories they told me uh, and then asking for help assistance with actually getting vaccinated. 
And since that time, many have come forward and apologized and asked for forgiveness and assistance uh, on getting vaccinated. And uh, things that didn't work, um, our trial to engage uh, community uh, leaders and faith leaders, uh, they were hesitant to make the decisions for their community as a whole. They chose to maintain neutral. Participating in debates never worked. Um, addressing every single myth that arose, I left those alone and just let them kind of fade away on their own. Uh, attempting to change people's minds about their beliefs. A lot of this goes way deep into belief systems that um, are hard to, to manage. Uh, group conversation, never a good idea uh, because people start to argue and then it just turns into uh, hurt feelings and, and uh, arguing. Um, participating or presenting government and World Health Organization stats uh, is never a good idea in this community because they don't trust or the, the history of the mistrust in government um, entities and so on. Um, I do have many resources. If uh, anyone is interested, I can share later. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anna. I think three things to share uh, our learning. This is one was our one-to-one -one outreach. Uh, conversation with uh, our one-to-one -one outreach. It is intensive with two community outreach workers uh, worked well. Uh, unlike the our previous uh, guest speakers, uh, the vaccine work with us was too personal, too confidential, uh, and too sacred. That is uh, with one-to-one -one, uh, people. The other thing that worked well uh, was, uh, Anna mentioned about government, uh, you know, flyers or about vaccine information. Uh, we learned that rather than pushing information, we need to identify their objection around the vaccine. We need to identify what questions, concerns they have and respond rather than putting in information about vaccine. We start ask, asking them their concerns and their objection. We have tried too many flyers, it didn't work. I will read you one script, a very short script on the radio that changes the whole situation. Uh, the radio ad uh, was sent from our nurse practitioner. Uh, for me, it was from paternalism to caring professionalism that the, our nurse practitioner uh, did. It says, my name is Maria, and I'm a nurse practitioner at Willish Community Health Center in St. Jacobs, Ontario. I'm not sure what I could possibly say to you to help you feel comfortable to get the vaccine if you have not already. I'm sure you have heard so many different things about uh, the pandemic and about the vaccine. I also know that you have deeply considered so many questions like, what does it mean to be a Mananite in 2021? What is the meaningful response to the pandemic and how to remain faithful in this uncertain time with so many different rules? Whose authority will I follow, gods or government? What is a non-conformist response to the pandemic? What I want you to know is that it hurts me to see people suffer. That is one of the reasons I work as a nurse practitioner. It, it is sad for me to see that Mananites are making choices to not get vaccinated and or not get tested here in Waterloo region and across Canada. It means that sometimes people are waiting too long to come for help. I encourage you to keep talking with your families and your health care providers. We are here to help when you are ready. This was uh, after more than three months of uh, flyers, uh, newsletter ads around the vaccine. This was that uh, changes the whole situation where our receptionist complained that they uh, got in one week too many phone calls. Uh, they were overwhelmed by this. This is one way of how we as a professional move from paternalism to caring professionalism. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Kure and Anna. It's really great to hear the, the approach that you take with just such a, a specific, unique community with their own communication channels and with the, a, a, their own culture um, that you need to understand and, and penetrate. So thank you so much for sharing that. Next, we will be hearing from Nemo Farah, Program Manager, and Frederick Guiana, Mental Health Navigator for the African, Caribbean, and Black communities at Not Ottawa Newcomer Health Center. Over to you, Nemo. Thank you, Sonia. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. I'll just wait for the slides to come up first. While we're waiting for the slides, feel free to enter any questions that you might have um, as we will be entering into our Q&A section right after Nemo and Frederick shares their work in Ottawa. Apologies for the delay here while we're just getting the slides up. I feel like we need some music or something at this point. I, I won't sing because that will be disastrous, but awkward silence. <laughs> so we should have built in here a, a music break. Ronnie, are you able to get the slides up? Yeah, uh, sorry folks, just give me a sec as I uh, put up. <clears throat> Her slides. I'm uh, having trouble identifying which slide it is. Uh, number four is Taibu. Oh, sorry. Apologies. One second. Yeah, there was some slight confusion with the slide versions. So bear with us. You put slide one up. Slide one. Okay, got it. Coming. Great, thank you so much for posting them. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank the Alliance and for the invitation and the opportunity to connect with you all this afternoon. My name is Nemo Farah. I'm the manager of the Ottawa Newcomer Health Center and my colleague, Frederick Viona, ACB Community Outreach Worker will be today sharing some of our experiences um, and some of the work that we've been doing here in Ottawa. Next slide. So just to give you a broad overview of what the Ottawa Newcomer Health Center is, it, the Ottawa Newcomer Health Center is actually part of Somerset West Community Health Center. Our journey began in 2009 with a unique partnership um, with the Catholic Center for Immigrants, which is a settlement agency here based in Ottawa, um, and a partnership to be co-located to be able to provide multiple services. So initially, when we first began, we started off with a clinic, a very small clinic, and it's a clinic that provided um, temporary primary care access um, for clients, bridge healthcare services. But as, as we kept growing, uh, the need from the community kept expanding. So we kept adding on to the service provisions that we have in-house. So thereafter, we developed the Multicultural Health Navigator Program, which is a program that assists clients with system navigation support. Then we also incorporated the integrated and mental health trauma program that provides short-term and long-term counseling services to clients ex experiencing moderate to severe trauma. And we also have a language interpretation program in-house as well um, that provides access to professionally trained health interpreters to support clients as they navigate their health care within the city. We also have a social enterprise incorporated into that. And it's the only social enterprise that is actually part of a community health center here in the city of Ottawa. Next slide. So as you know, as all of my colleagues have also been presenting today, data has shown that racialized communities have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. Many face limited access to healthcare and social protections such as sick leave, and they also have lower healthcare utilization in comparison to other communities. So when the pandemic hit, we actually never closed our doors. We continued to provide services in the community and we just shifted our model 
to become um, both virtual as well as in-person services. So we were, were able to keep the clinic doors open and clients were able to still come in and see their primary care providers. But we also provided opportunities to be able to connect with providers either virtually or by phone. But there is a digital inequity within the community in the sense that not everybody has access to devices. So we made sure that we had availability for in-person visits as well. Access to trauma-informed mental health services also was increasing and in, in our demand um, started to go up and up as clients have started to experience mental health distress all, um, put um, exasperated by the pandemic. Our system navigators were also supporting clients and helping them connect to various community social services and health services. So for example, when access to financial support came available by the government that served, not a lot of clients knew how to navigate the process. So they needed support of where to go, how to fill in the applications and um, what documents that they needed. So somebody to help them and coach them through the process. And our team was on site providing these services to them. Supporting clients also with self-isolation. So those clients who were testing positive, since they couldn't go out, they were stuck. They needed support and we were there to be able to help them arrange for food delivery, dropping off sanitation products, um, sharing food voucher cards and connecting them to also other financial resources that they were qualifying for. Our staff also pivoted to run vaccine clinics as well as health education events as needed. So as the demand shifted within the community, we had to be nimble um, and provide the supports. And the best way of doing that was really to really assess what the clients needed and then matching them to those services as well. Next slide. So when it came to actually engaging within community, we used a bottom-up approach to work with the community and approach the conversation from a place of understanding. People are really dealing with so many concerns. They face food insecurity, rent increases, precarious work situations, either kids are working from home and all of a sudden parents are teachers now, and sometimes their basic needs were not even being met. So it's not that people were not willing to get vaccinated, it's that the vaccines became, um, when the vaccines became available, it's that the social determinants of health and all of the other barriers they faced became an upstream swim against the adverse forces that makes it challenging for people to get vaccinated. So the work that we were doing as part of Somerset West Community Health Center was to reach these priority communities um, and build the, and based on our trusted relationships, work with the community in multiple ways to be able to increase access. So we really tried to use a harm reduction approach to do this work and community developers such as Frederick will be speaking shortly, um, were pivotal to doing this work. We created spaces where people could come have one-on-one -on -one conversations with providers, um, providers that were reflective of the communities that they were from as well, and then share different information using virtual platforms as well as um, non-conventional media outlets like WhatsApp to be able to share information um, and make sure those information was in multiple languages because our community as not only French and English speaking, we have a very diverse community. So our job was really to make sure that people had the access and the information that they needed to make better health informed choices for, their, for themselves and for their communities as well. We also tried to diversify our activities and socialize the vaccine. So in the fall, we had um, ACB soccer tournament and we encouraged different soccer teams in the city to come out. We made it fun for people. And then we also partnered with Ottawa Public Health, which is our local public health agency here, to be, have vaccine access on site. So we had immunizers that were all for also from the ACB community there to be able to help people um, gain access to their vaccines. And we found, found success using these types of mixed models of services and combating vaccine hesitancy within the community. We also tried to support clients access some um, transportation support, like if they couldn't they get to a certain uh, vaccine hub clinic, we um, distributed bus tickets and um, taxi chits to be able to support them get to their appointments. Next slide. So this is just a, a collection of some of the data that we've done and some of the activities that have resulted out of the work. So um, Frederick, for example, when he's out in the community door knocking, we've had over eight, 1,800 interactions with families at their doors, helping them book their appointments, distributing information or connecting them to resources. Um, through our work, we've been able to vaccinate over a, a thousand clients. 
We've had over 27 outreach events in the community. We've also had six community vaccine clinics held in key locations within the city to make things easier on clients in terms of accessibility. We've also done several virtual um, education sessions and attendance usually fluctuated between 70 to sometimes a max of 200 people who attended. Next slide. So this is just a, a collection of some of the strategies that we found useful and we wanted to share it with the group today. Um, we tried many different things, but some of these are the ones that were the ones that were most successful in, in, in enabling us to really combat vaccine hesitancy within the community. So the number one would be to build trust. So we built on leverage trust within the community and built a for us by us type of model of care and use community ambassadors to be able to do this work. And, the next slide is actually talking about community ambassadors and a client who became one. Um, we also diversified our model. So each community is different. We try to avoid one size fits all approach because something that worked for one community didn't necessarily work for the other. So we, may, we kept that in mind. And based on what we were hearing from the community and the conversations that were coming out, we tailored our responses to be able to support them and meet them halfway. We also ensured that, um, that we, we, pay, we pay special attention to at-risk populations. So for example, undocumented clients. Um, we had a financial program here in the city of Ottawa that supports undocumented clients for emergency COVID support. So through that program that we were administering, we were able to connect with the clients and then also gave them access to the vaccine as well. We were also advocating for clients um, with, with disabilities to make sure that they had easy access clinics for them and even flexing the hours of the clinics as well because sometimes people are working from nine to five or they're in school. So it, stretching the hours of the clinics also made it easier for the community to get vaccinated. Um, something else that was really important for us was making sure that we hired from the community. So making it very inclusive and um, racialized Having racialized providers working alongside um, the community made it easier for people to be able to trust the sources of information they were receiving and more willing to be able to come in and have those conversations and then lead to people getting vaccinated thereafter. Health literacy was also important to make sure that resources were available in multiple resources, multiple languages. Um, and then providing a safe space that was non-judgmental for clients. So we really weren't trying to push anything on the clients. It really was just providing that space for them to ask the questions, get the resources and get the help that they needed. Um, we also partnered with various other organizations within the city. Um, as my, my colleague from Taibo also was saying, we also partnered with the Black Physicians Coalition here in Ottawa to provide um, Black immunizers on site. We also partner with Ottawa Public Health and ACB Wellness Center and various different other faith organizations to be able to reach the community at large. Next slide. Um, this slide, my colleague Frederick will speak to it, it, but we wanted to share a story and just so that people understand the type of work that we're doing. It's not um, a one size fits all and it's not that it's, it's just um, connecting with clients in multiple ways to be able to make sure that resources are getting connected that they need. So Frederick will speak to the slide. Oui, merci Nimo. Mon nom est Frédéric Bouyana, je suis navigateur de santé. Pour les... Thank you. Thank you for passing me the mic, Fron. So my name is Frederick Bouyana, and I am a mental health case management and COVID-19 outreach worker for the ACB communities. So now when I'm speaking of this um, ACB or the ACN or ACB, I'm referring to African, Caribbean and Black communities. So I work with these uh, communities. I want to talk and give you a concrete example. So I want to talk about a single mother with three children. And she had linguistic uh, uh, obstacles. And uh, they needed to have uh, access to health services and social services. This client was very hesitant to get vaccinated because she thought that the vaccines were associated with information that she had learned within the community. For example, she told me that she had learned that uh, 
it is related to anti antichrist. It's part of the antichrist that like related to certain religious activities, and she was very afraid. So the health information in terms of public health was not available in both English and French, or uh, rather was only available in English and French. And it was difficult for people to understand the information if they didn't speak either English and French. And we noticed that the, the lack of access to credible sources in different languages that impacted the vaccine uptake or acceptation in the racialized communities, including uh, African, Caribbean, and Black persons. And so we really work with uh, client support. Uh, we work with a lot of single parents, and we really work on their immediate needs. And we and legal resources, we give them social resources. So we have health aspects that can respond to health related questions. Um, I'm trained in social work, for example, so I can provide that information. But for medical information, we have to have a doctor uh, be able to explain the person with respect to their needs. So during the intervention that we our approach is trust based without judging people with respect to vaccination. And for example, in dealing with this particular mother, the experience that I, uh, I want to state that we have uh, we have certain neighborhoods like the Vanier Ottawa neighborhood where we have where we need multilingual persons in order to provide credible information in several languages for everyone. They have to be able to understand the information. For example, as I was telling you, this woman who did not speak either English or French but on speaking to her in Swahili, that's an African language, and the mother was able to understand all of the information. So all of us led us to have success. The mother, she accepted what we were, uh, us getting her an appointment to get vaccinated. And she was also able to vaccinate her children. And in fact, she became an ambassador in her community to encourage other people to get vaccinated. Thank you so much, Frederick. Um, we wanted to share this story with everybody because these one-on-one -on -one conversations are so important. There's so much misinformation that's happening in the community and having these interactions um, enables us to make better progress and then enables individuals that when you, once you understand the information, you don't fear it. Naturally, when you, you don't when you don't understand something, you fear it, so then you avoid it. But when you have the opportunity to connect with others to be able to provide answers to the questions that you have, and they're all legitimate questions, then you have that capacity to be able to build confidence within the community and build ambassadors just as this client to be able to go to her friends, her neighbors, and her inner circle to be able to share the fact that, you know, she was vaccinated, her kids were vaccinated, and she's doing really well, and she's not having any adverse effects. Um, once you see those interactions, they really help and they move the conversation along. So we wanted to share this with the group today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Nemo and Frederick. It is really great to um, sort of put your the strategies that you're using into encapsulate that into um, a real sort of person's um, going to connect, make that connection with with what how it's experienced uh, on the ground. So we do have a few questions, uh, and while we um, pose those questions, um, I'll ask all the presenters to come back on video. But also, we would love to hear from you um, on whether. Um, 
our speakers have helped you to better understand what some of the barriers and opportunities are when working with specific populations to promote vaccine uptake. So we would really appreciate uh, you filling out this poll. It's called the exit poll, but we are not finished uh, yet. Uh, we do have some great questions for our presenters. Um, so first question, um, as you fill out this exit poll, is what is the significance um, I believe this is geared towards AMNA, but I think it is also true for some of the other centers. What is the significance of only offering Pfizer um, in your vaccine clinic? AMNA, do you want to take Hi, that Anna. first? Sure. So um, I would say we have been open for like eight or nine months. In that time, we've only offered Moderna maybe four days of, that, of, of all the time that we've been open. And in those four days that we offered Moderna, I would say more than half of the people who came by walked away uh, from the vaccine clinic. So they had made the decision to come get the vaccine. They had an appointment. They found out that we had Moderna that day and then they left. And a lot of the people that were turning away were Afro-Caribbean Black um, and they were older. So it was really heartbreaking to watch a bunch of 60, 70, 80 year olds walk away from the vaccine at a time when um, the vaccines were just getting rolled out. Uh, for whatever reason, I'm sure there's a myriad of reasons, there seems to be some kind of um, community preference towards the Pfizer vaccine, even though we know that Pfizer and Moderna are extremely comparable. Um, every time somebody comes through our building, they will ask us no less than five times, do you have Pfizer? Do you have Pfizer? Do you have Pfizer? Do you have Pfizer? And uh, they'll be signs everywhere, they'll ask registrations, they'll ask security, they'll ask us, they'll ask the nurses, they'll ask the doctors, they'll ask us as they're leaving, I got Pfizer, right? And uh, we have had to, uh, with our collaborators, with, with multiple different people that we work with to make this vaccine clinic possible, we've had to advocate very hard to have only Pfizer at our clinic because um, the moment you, like the thing is the supply is not very predictable so if you book appointments with people after talking to them for so long, like Nemo uh, was talking about, and you tell them, yes, we have Pfizer, and then they come to your clinic and then they find out you have Moderna because your supply has changed, all that trust that you built up is immediately broken and they don't want to hear a word that you've said now. So that became, became very difficult for us. And so hundreds of conversations were happening over and over again. We even tried to have all of the physicians that we work with do like education sessions around Moderna, we tried everything you could think of to make this, uh, to communicate the, the, the effectiveness of Moderna, but it just didn't work. So we've had to uh, communicate with the people who supply our vaccine to say that if we're running a clinic at Taibu, it's gotta be Pfizer only. Thank you, Amna. Is there anyone else who would like to add to that? Hey, oh, Anna, go ahead. Uh, yes, yeah, similar um, at our clinics as well. Um, making sure that Pfizer was available. I think, yeah, the, there's something about the first one and people who have had the first one, there's more time that they've been able to see that it, they haven't died yet or they haven't grown a second head or all those conspiracies and the stories that they hear about. And then if, yes, exactly the same, if, some, if we've said we had uh, Pfizer and then we didn't, um, that is the government, that's us tricking them uh, to lure them in for one thing and then changing. So yeah, it's absolutely vital that you, the story that they started with stays the same <laughs> until the end. Uh, and yeah, pulling people aside to explain that we ran out of Pfizer, now we have Moderna and it's safe and this not getting the nurses involved. Um, still some will walk away as well. Thank you, Anna. Um, I have a question that's for Nemo, but also um, other presenters, if feel free to jump in, is um, I know you've made a mention to a harm reduction approach to vaccine promotion. Can you expand a bit on that, what that means? Yes, definitely. Um, so applying a harm reduction approach for us was really just going in with the lens of not trying to convince or coerce anybody to do something that they weren't interested in. At the end of the day, we wanted to respect their autonomy, um, but our jobs was just making sure that they had the information that in their hands and they knew where to go if, if you know, along the conversation when they decided to change their minds um, to do get vaccinated, that they knew that we were there to support them. So 
coming into the community, um, having a non-judgmental approach, making sure that you had access to um, community health workers and different nurses or, or physicians or whatnot, um, coming from diverse communities, coming to them, essentially just trying to provide support. It wasn't along the lines of you have to get vaccinated because you know if you wanna be able to access grocery stores or if you wanna be able to access any um, recreational activities then you need to show proof of vaccination. And this is coming down from the government. It really, from our perspective, was not breaking the trust that we've established over the last decade of working with the community, but making sure that they understood that um, we were really just there for their best interest. And we were there to, to help them through this process, but we weren't there to coerce anybody because at the end of the day, each individual has the right and autonomy to choose what they want for themselves as well as from their families. But once the people were equipped with the effective information and information that was up to date because everything kept changing so quickly. Um, even at the very beginning, um, I, like when they told you, you only had to start with the same vaccine that you received the first time around. And then all of a sudden the, the government was saying that, you know, you can interchange the vaccines. It's okay. It's safe. All of this, it, it's just, um, it took a lot of time for it to be able to sink in with the community. Um, and you needed that perspective of, of giving people that time, that opportunity to be able to make their own decisions, but making sure they're making decisions based on the accurate facts. So I think that's where we were approaching it from. I hope that answered the question. Thank you, Nemo. Any additions to that? Please. Now, I know that many people spoke around the importance of that, um, the, the family and friend network and those trusted relationships. Outside of that, do you have recommendations on websites or social medias that have been doing a good job or that you have been finding helpful or as influential in the communities that you work with? We see it's a lot of thinking heads. Um, if you think of things, I know that's probably hard to share uh, verbally, um, you can share them with me and we will be sharing out along with the slide and recording, we will also be sharing out a list of resources. So we will be including that for you as well. I think as maybe as a last question before we uh, close um, or we move back to Sarah to close us off and do a little bit of summary. For people on the line who may not be on a, in a community health center, who doesn't have this team support, what would be your recommendation for maybe your one recommendation um, if they are interested in, in supporting um, sort of vaccine information and promotion within these communities that you work in? Estelle, I'm gonna go to you first. I'd say what was fundamental for us that the appointments and have people who are able to in the community and definitely whatever the format is, that could be an employee format. These liaison roles are all the diff make all the difference. So I think what I heard is that sort of that community outreach, that person from the community speaks the language of the community doing that liaison role. Thank you, Estelle. Other people in your one recommendation. Frederick. Yes, for example, we worked with community leaders and religious leaders. So these leaders also allowed to make the message, pass the message out, pass the message on, and also to reach that community. Firstly, he under, they understand the message, message and then they share it in their community. And uh, that's how we manage that. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Amna, before we close the question period. Um, yeah, I think from our perspective, the main uh, point is that all of this work takes a lot of time. And when you're responding to a crisis, yes, there's acute things that you're doing to respond to the crisis in that moment. But 
a lot of it is not possible or effective or not as effective as it could be without the years of work before that. And all of that requires funding to make that happen. And even the acute work that we're doing now, such as doing vaccines, like we, we consider it on the ground as a marathon. It's never a sprint. Every individual vaccine is just as important. And we still get first doses coming through the door to this day. And we always like make a big noise about it and we're clapping and we're excited. And each individual thing matters. Like we've had, we had one pop-up clinic that we did in the community that uh, we thought was going to be a 30 minute info session and some vaccines, maybe. It ended up being a two hour discussion because people had so many questions for our doctors and we got three first doses done and we were all so excited. And that was considered a huge success uh, because all those individuals add up to, to the goal that we have ultimately. Thank you so much, Ashley. That, I think, Amna, that's a perfect transition. Um, I'm going to invite Sarah back here to share how we can sustain and build on all of the lessons learned here, and particularly on the trust that everyone has emphasized. Over to you, Sarah. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sonia. And, and thank you to all of our panelists for your presentations, uh, for the incredible work, and for sharing your lessons learned. Um, it is so powerful, I think, what you shared with us today. So thank you. Uh, we have seen how these hyperlocal pandemic responses worked to move the needle on vaccine uptake. Despite the diversity of these innovations, there are common elements which are key to addressing the current pandemic as well as future challenges. And these enablers include uh, establishing and building trusted relationships. We spoke so much, the panelists spoke so much about trust today. Um, and trust is a word that we hear a lot. Um, trust in healthcare providers, trust in community, trust in science, trust in vaccines, trust in public health measure, measures, and trust in our leaders. If we take a moment to pull apart how trust is built, sustained, and protected, we can see that trust takes time and real engagement to nurture. Alliance members demonstrate through their long-standing relationships with their communities that they were able to leverage relationships of trust between themselves and their clients, themselves and the community, between their organizations and their community governors and, and between their organizations and community partners. Having a foundation of trust has meant that expanding trust, building ambassador networks and programs and forging new pro relationships with public health and other organizations was work that did not have to start from scratch. Community health organizations across Ontario are embedded in and shared relationships with the people that they serve. During the pandemic, the urgency to build on those relationships was seen uh, as a wider innovation to address new barriers, ensure access to services and support, and to ensure that that trust is sustained. The second enabler that we have seen is being creative, collaborative, and nimble. Our panelists have demonstrated how they were adapted to, uh, to their community by uncovering the barriers and needs of the community through focus groups, responding by intentional door-to-door -door outreach and community ambassadors uh, with community ambassadors who reflect the linguistic and ethnic uh, backgrounds of the populations they were reaching, community and pop-up clinics to make vaccination more accessible and culturally safe within community contexts, providing logistical support such as booking um, and transportation, partnering with uh, local transportation services, schools, faith leaders, and cultural spaces to share information and provide vaccination in familiar spaces that is perceived to be safe. Finally, holding town halls to address misinformation and answer questions in a variety of languages and providing live interpretation in physician offices and vaccine clinics. Alliance members continue to listen deeply and respond innovatively with tailored approaches to advance vaccine confidence in communities where there are long histories of medical distrust and systemic barriers from historical underfunding. This deep level of engagement in enabling uh, by longstanding trusted relationships with priority populations by community governance and engagement and by prioritizing the needs of the community and meeting them where they are at. Lastly, and importantly, as an enabler, we need to sustain trust through investments, resources, and support. The lessons learned in communities across Ontario must endure beyond the pandemic. Robust investments in community-led strategies can help sustain and expand relationships of trust between the health system and marginalized populations and reduce inequities that lead to poor health outcomes. Health system leadership will play a key role in ensuring the strides that we've made in building trust are sustained.
to emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic equitably, equitably and address other health needs in future crises, including the expected massive backlogs in cancer screenings, chronic disease management, and declines in mental health, we must build on the power and community that you've seen here today uh, from our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us and a big thanks to our interpreters and to the technical support at Zoom. Uh, we will absolutely be sharing the slide deck and recording from this event later this week. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon. People left, I'm not sure where we're at. I see you all still.